All right, we want to uh, <coughs> discuss a couple of uh, rather interesting uh, features that fit together and a challenge. A um, person who's writing a book in England wrote to me several years ago and said, like I'm writing this book, uh, prove to me that radiometric dating is uh, not correct. <laughs> uh, you know, scientists don't ask proof, but anyway, that's what he wanted. Uh, and I told him, well, uh, the one argument I think is simplest for you, it was a book for uh, elementary and secondary school uh, students. Uh, uh, I said, well, the, the one argument that probably the, the simplest and most comprehensive uh, uh, in terms of its uh, effect and so on is rates of erosion. I said, rates of erosion, you cannot reconcile them with the radiometric uh, dating. It's, it's a real problem. And uh, <coughs> so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's an issue that uh, very significant. It's part of this series that we were uh, discussing about what every uh, advanced scientist should know. And uh, <coughs> we're our section on general philosophy, which we have not covered yet. Uh, and has a number of details there, God, origin of life, and so on. Uh, these various uh, parts we'll be covering later on. And then there is uh, this one that involves what we're talking about today, uh, which deals with uh, how old is life on Earth, and uh, was there a flood? <coughs> and uh, widespread layers and turbidites, so on, rates of erosion and uplift, that the second one down there is what we are talking about today. <coughs> and uh, we've covered, uh, I think, the three bottom ones already and so on. We're getting through this list here. And later on, you'll have some others like uh, challenges to the young of cre creationism and Ellen White's uh, discussions in general and the uh, alcohol uh, question, which is a salient interest uh, nowadays. So this is. Uh, what we're discussing here uh, <coughs> today, uh, geologic questions about geologic time. References, uh, you can find an awful lot of references dealing with this topic in a chapter in a book I wrote. Uh, it's titled <coughs> Chapter 15, Some Questions About Geologic Time. Uh, it's in the book Origins, Linking Science and Scripture. Uh, at least probably at least 50 references, geological references dealing with this, which uh, tells you a little bit about the uh, <coughs> scientific community's viewpoint on this thing. <coughs> then uh, if you want a, a broader discussion of the, the time issue and its implications, uh, and some of the factors related to it uh, in the book, uh, Science that discovers God, you'll find in chapter five, so little time for everything. And a lot of references in there. And then, uh, but if you have students that are interested in looking at this on the internet, and that's uh, their mode nowadays, you know, uh, they can just go to my webpage, uh, which is listed down there at the bottom, and look at discussion number nine, the great time questions, part three, data favoring the recent uh, <coughs> creation. Uh, this is a <coughs> part of a series, 17 discussions in that, in that uh, thing, uh, over a thousand slides uh, for, for the student to uh, study, uh, plus questions for them to answer and so on. It's designed for uh, mainly uh, secondary students, elementary and secondary students and so on. But Get into today's topic, the conflict. Uh, science says no God, life evolved by itself over billions of years. <coughs> or if, they, if you want to admit a God, you can't allow him into science. You might as well say no God. The Bible says God created six days just a few thousand years ago. Um, many 
Christian groups like compromise and say, well, let's put the two together here. God created it over billions of years. I want you to note the contrast here. The science viewpoint is billions of years. The Bible is thousands of years. The compromise is billions of years. We're discussing that difference between the Bible and these other views. <coughs> now, geologic calm. I, I know you're not all familiar with geologic calm, but I thought I'd try and give you just a few things uh, to keep in mind. It's, it's the order of those layers out there. And uh, you have uh, dates for them. And on the right-hand column, you have the uh, geological interpretation of those dates in terms of millions of years. And so uh, you have Mesozoic, Paleozoic, and Cenozoic as three main divisions here towards the left. You see Phanerozoic, that's the part that has mostly the fossil, most all the fossils, at least the visible fossils, uh, are in the, the Phanerozoic. Below you have Precambrian, origin of the Earth, 4,600 million years ago, or 4.6 billion, and uh, so on. Cambrian, 540 million, uh, and so on. And the uh, dates, of course, get younger as you uh, move on up through the layers. Uh, this is a part of those layers. This is the Grand Canyon. You know, this is only the Paleozoic part of the Grand Canyon. Uh, there are, this is a part, the lower part of the geologic column. That arrow points to you to, we have that major difference. It's the Cambrian explosion there. That's where uh, all of a sudden our major fossils appear. And uh, then there are lay many layers above it here. So, uh, 540 million years down at the bottom there where that red arrow is on top, but 250 million years. And many layers above that. And so the question is, are these layers out there in <coughs> life and so on, did it evolve over these billions of years? Or uh, is it the result of the flood, as the biblical interpretation would be? And uh, <coughs> this, you have your geologic column here at the left. <coughs> you have the evolutionary interpretation, where you have evolution over billions of years throughout all those layers. And then at the right, you have the biblical interpretation. And note that we're talking about thousands of years here. In the biblical side, we're talking about millions of years over here in the left-hand interpretation. And so this is the big question. <coughs> were these things laid down rapidly during the flood? as described in the Bible, or did they evolve over billions of years, uh, as you have in that middle column there. <coughs> so moving on from mm -hmm. there, uh, <coughs> we're going to discuss today uh, two main topics, but uh, it, it fits nicely into three. <coughs> Excuse me. Raising questions by erosion rates, Rates of volcanic activity, which involves some uh, mountain building and so on, and uh, rates of uh, mountain uplift. Uh, because, of course, you have mountains, they erode, and so does everything else. Uh, unless you have deposition, in which case you have buildup. <coughs> Probably no part of the Earth, uh, or really no significant area of the Earth, doesn't either erode or have sedimentation over the long periods of time proposed. Uh, you can have quiet periods for a short period of time, but over the at least the millions of years suggested uh, in the uh, geologic county, you'd, you'd expect something to happen there. There's no area of the earth that escapes the effects of weathering or of deposition. Well. The argument that we're presenting here is that the present rates 
of these various factors are so fast they raise serious questions about the long genetic ages. Namely, our continent's 2,500 million years old. Uh, did the pharynx start 540 million years and so on? Or is it the biblical interpretation that things happened recently a few thousand years ago? <coughs> uh, one word of caution. We're dealing here with historical science. These are not things you can observe now. It's not observational science or experimental science uh, that you can repeat. It is indirect interpretation, so keep that in mind. The past may have been different. That's uh, uh, entirely possible, but uh, you don't want to uh, just let your imagination run wild. Uh, you like to have some evidence for when you say something is different in the past. Genesis flood introduces a major factor which is not considered in the scientific literature, but is extremely significant in connection with the biblical model. God creates and then uh, humanity uh, becomes wicked and God has to destroy it by this flood and we have water over the whole earth and then we have that water receding. That flood extremely important in interpreting what we're talking about today in the biblical context and it is uh, very much ignored and either models of uh, compromise or models of long uh, ages per se. Uh, however, uh, in spite of these problems of uh, historical science and so on, uh, we're, we're, uh, the time differences between the, the two models that we are considering here are so great that uh, some of these uncertainties become minimal and you can raise rather serious questions uh, like rates of erosion in the context of the, are we talking about billions of years here? Or are we talking about a few thousand years? So let's consider first rates of erosion. Rates of erosion are too fast to be sustained over the long geologic ages. <coughs> this is a, uh, a reality that the uh, geological community became aware of oh, a little over half a century ago in, eight, in the 1950s and so on. Uh, they, they realized, hey, uh, these, these rates of erosion don't fit with the long geological ages. And uh, so, you know, there are several publications, some textbooks included it in their discussions and so on and so forth. Uh, the problem is recognized. And it's, uh, you know, put on the shelf or some explanations are suggested, but th the differences are so extreme that it's, it's difficult to, uh, to explain it away that easily. We'll consider some of the explanations in just a minute. Uh, Flash Flood, Red Canyon, Utah. They're um, once isolated us, <coughs> a group of students I had with me, isolated us from uh, the road and so on because it just came suddenly and all this debris was being carried away. Rivers do this. They carry material to the ocean. And, you know, it doesn't go the other way. <coughs> Uh, this is in Utah, again, this is down by Kanab. Uh, and uh, you notice that red arrow there. Before a flash flood, uh, the, the whole area was at the level of that red arrow. You can see a stream down in the bottom here, curving around, back around through uh, the various buttes here. And that uh, erosion took place in eight hours. Eight hours? Eight hours. Uh, the thing dropped down. 
Well, your rodents can occur rapidly if you have enough water. Uh, that's, that's slow compared to what you can do if you have enough water. Uh, Teton Dam went much faster than that and so on. So, uh, uh, but it, 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 things can occur uh, fairly rapidly. And uh, <coughs> you can evaluate how fast erosion is, is by looking at uh, the rate at which sediments go into the ocean. You have an island here, for instance, and uh, you notice the blue lines are, these represent the rivers, okay? And uh, there are three different rivers here. Each has its erosional basin, or if a drop of water falls in a certain place, it's going to uh, eventually end up, at least if you have enough drops of water, uh, end up in the ocean. Uh, you, and so you go to the mouths of these rivers, you measure the amount of sediment that's going into the ocean, and you can tell how fast that erosional basin is being eroded away. Uh, and so you can tell how long that island's going to last. And this has been done for all the major rivers of the world and so on. Many studies on this. How fast are the continents being washed away by, by uh, the rivers and the creeks and the rainfall and so on, the weathering and all that's involved in this erosional process. And here are some uh, studies of various rivers of the world. Uh, and uh, this is in millimeters per 1,000 years. Sounds very slow, you know. You start, you start putting, multiplying those by the millions of years those continents are supposed to be there, and then you're in deep trouble. This is what we're talking about today. Uh, <clears throat> Waiho River in China, uh, 1,350 millimeters per 1,000 years. So on. Wangho, uh, the Yellow River, uh, 900, Ganges and so on, uh, <coughs> India and so on, quite rapid, Ryan Rhone and so on. San Juan, USA, that's, that's, uh, we visit that quite often and so on, 340 Irrawaddy, uh, let's see, that's in uh, uh, Mir Miramar, uh, Miramar, uh, Burma, yes, that's where you used to call it that anyway. Uh, Tigre, Isier, France, and so on. And you get clear down here to, to the Connecticut River, one millimeter per 1,000 years. And it depends on the terrain, especially the rocks. The reason the Connecticut River is so slow is that you have very hard schists there in the, uh, in the bed. It's a very hard rock. And so, it, you know, it, it doesn't erode very fast. Very little sediment comes out uh, from the uh, Connecticut River. But even at one millimeter per year, uh, excuse me, uh, per thousand years, at one millimeter per thousand years, uh, you could still erode all our continents of the Earth flat at least four times in geologic time. And so the question arises, why in the world are our continents still here if they are these billions of years old? They should have been flattened out, flattened out several times, even at this rate, of one millimeter. Uh, of course, you understand, a while ago, you've got 1,350 times faster. And so uh, what becomes important is uh, in terms of analyzing the Earth as a whole, it's the average. Many studies have been done regarding the average, uh, but first they comment here, or Ross Parkinson, one, one textbook on this, he's talking about uh, <coughs> these rates. He says, some of these rates are obviously staggering. The Yellow River, that's the Wong Ho in that last table, uh, Yellow River, could peneplain an area with an average height of that of Everest in 10 million years. So, if you can er erode something that's high as high as Mount Everest in 10 million years, why are our continents still here? 
why are our mountains still here? It's admitted in the, in the, uh, in the literature, the problem is admitted, uh, but in suggested explanations are not very satisfactory, but this is so simple. It's right there. You don't have to go through all kinds of exceptions like you do for geometric dating and so on. And it's rather direct evidence, hey, uh, I can't put this game together. Uh, here are 12 studies. These have kind of become classic. You, right now, you don't see many studies right now about this. Uh, once in a while, the figure comes up, and they seem, tend to agree with all these. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's no point in reinventing the wheel uh, once you've done it so many times in the past. Uh, some of these are classic, they haven't referred to these. These are of uh, how fast uh, are all these rivers carrying sediment to the ocean? And so you've got, uh, I mean, million metric tons per year. And different studies, different dates, and so on. This is when that, that they were doing all that, you know, when they got excited about this thing. Uh, we move from one exciting idea to another in geology, uh, uh, like you do in other areas. Uh, and this was exciting at that time. <coughs> and some of them more recent, so on. But they, they come up with figures, you know, that are, you average the mile, you get about 24,000 million metric tons, or you could say 24 uh, billion uh, metric tons per year. How fast is that going to lower your continents? Well, it's very easy to convert uh, the amount of sediment going into uh, volume of the rocks and so on. Uh, it would lower your continents. Uh, at the rate of 61 millimeters per thousand years. 61 millimeters uh, per thousand years. Sounds slow, but over billions of years, it's devastating to, to the uh, continents themselves. They should be long gone. <coughs> In fact, should be gone conservatively at least 100 times. Uh, one statement in the textbook uh, showed up says, North America has been doing it at a rate that could level it in a mere 10 million years. Or to put it in another way, at the same rate, 10 North Americas could have been eroded since Middle Cretaceous time 100 million years ago. Well, if you could erode North America in 10 million years, and 10 times since Cretaceous, how come it's still here? That's, that's the issue. How come it's still here? And, and you know, it's uh, something to be contented with. <laughs> uh, questions? Uh, well, some say, well, uh, climate could have been different in the past. Well, we know, all know that climate can change, and so on. But it can't change that much, and you maintain the flora and fauna that you have in the fossil record. So it hasn't changed all that much. And you know, when you're, when you're talking about, hey, uh, our continents have been eroded away at least 100 times, uh, you really need major <laughs> climatic changes, you know? But you look at the plants and the animals. Uh, if anything, the data suggests uh, probably the continents were wetter in the past than they are right at present, which doesn't help. Uh, along that idea that, hey, uh, let's change the climate and let's not have any erosion uh, type of thing. Then there is a uh, question of the effect of agriculture. And uh, a lot of these studies do not take the effect of agriculture into, into consideration. It should be. Estimates are that, uh, well, may maybe uh, agriculture doubles the rate of erosion. And uh, so, cut your figures in half. It doesn't help very much, folks, when you're dealing with uh, such, such high figures. Uh, <coughs> generally, it's been suggested double and so on. A uh, recent study, uh, this is in uh, 2009, <coughs> so you yeah, hate hey, not quite that much at all. Uh, what they've been doing, just you know, see how much 
settlement leaves the farm uh, in a certain amount of time type thing, but uh, much of that does not reach the ocean. Uh, it's just recycled in another farm and so on. So the, the figures are probably uh, less than half. But it, it doesn't matter, uh, really, the, the discrepancy is so great, uh, it doesn't affect the general conclusion. Uh, <coughs> here is a uh, uh, comment about this uh, question of uh, <coughs> what, is, what goes on. How come we have mi mountains? How come we still have continents? You look in a lot of geology textbooks, especially the elementary ones, the simple ones, uh, in general, they say, and they, they, they'll admit, yeah, we, we, we have, sure, we've got erosion, but we've got uplift. And so the mounds keep being renewed from below. That's the, that's the, the, uh, the answer. Uh, quoting here from this one book on geology is one of many. Uh, the ultimate effect of this erosion would be to reduce the continents to a flat surface. Yeah, we all agree to that. <coughs> but there are two earth processes which tend to restore the balance, the tectonic uplift of the areas of both the existing continental offshore areas of sedimentation and diastrophism. And that, that is the usual standard answer that is given. Yeah, sure, we... we, we but these things are being renewed, so we still have mountains. So that is the, the, the standard answer. Volcanism is also mentioned here. Uh, the very process of igneous activity, volcanoes. Don't f Most of our major range, uh, mountain ranges are not volcanic. Uh, you have the Cascades, uh, and so on, Mount St. Helens, uh, Vesuvius, so on. You do have some major mountains. Uh, that are volcanic, but uh, in general, uh, we're dealing with sediments. Uh, only one seventh of your sedimentary record is volcanic. Neither of these will preserve the general geologic column from erosion. This is a key factor considering it. If you are going to renew the mountains, by uplifting them and eroding them and keep on eroding f fast as you assume erosion has been, you're going to destroy your geologic column. And it's still there. How come it's still there? We have not gone through even one complete cycle of erosion. If North America had been flattened out in 10 million years, in two and a half billion years, of course, you, you could uh, erode it 250 times. Well, correct for agriculture, say 125 times. Um, other fact, let's say 100 times. You, if you erode 100 times, your GI column is not going to be there anymore, folks. It's all there, and it's... It, you know, it's a strong witness that it hasn't even been eroded once completely. See, there, there is a rock cycle uh, in geological interpretations. And that is the idea that uh, <coughs> rocks uh, can go through a long cycle. And the cycle is that sedimentary rocks change into igneous rocks. Igneous rocks are your granite, your volcanic material, and so on, uh, those rocks and sediment. And so uh, granitic rocks originally, or, uh, and uh, other igneous rocks, uh, schist, basalts, and so on, uh, changed into sediments. Then we have the sediments for a while. And then they go down into the earth, and they've changed back into igneous rocks. That's your rock cycle. And uh, it's presented, you know, this is a standard uh, geological interpretation of all this. It's not that easy to do that game, incidentally. Uh, for instance, uh, you can't interchange igneous and sedimentary rocks 
because on an elemental basis, you change the crystals, of course, you change the, the minerals and so on, but on an elemental basis, uh, the uh, igneous rocks uh, are poor in uh, calcium. They have about half as much calcium as they should have. Uh, they are extremely poor in carbon. Less than 1% of the carbon you find in sedimentary rocks if you find in igneous rock. It doesn't match. Where do you get this? Or it's sodium, uh, three times as much sodium in igneous rocks as you have in sedimentary rocks. So you can't just easily switch those around, but it's the model. Uh, that's one way to uh, recycle all this. So you have these long cycles. <coughs> you, you uplift everything, but you, you don't have the, you can't do that and you recycle it because of the elemental differences, of course. Besides the fact that all the fossils are there, and obviously the things have not been recycled. So we've got this double problem there. Here, here's a, a mountain in France, in the Alps. Uh, it's made of calcium carbonate. And uh, interestingly, it forms a big S shape, uh, which fits in nicely. But it's not the story we're talking about today. We are pointing out here simply that this is Mesozoic, you know. Somewhere, you know, in the 150 million year age, for the and so on. Uh, according to average rates, of, this should have been wiped out at least 10 times. I, I'm sorry, 15 times in that time. How come it's here? Furthermore, it's of a composition of uh, carbonate, which has lots of carbon in it, has lots of uh, calcium in it. It's not going to make good igneous rocks if you go into that rock cycle thing. So, so there's that little problem there. Well, uh, conclusion about rates of erosion. One, present rates of erosion for the continents are about 60 millimeters per 1,000 years. Corrected for agriculture, we should expect an average of 30 millimeters. We're being generous uh, in that correction. <coughs> in 10 million years, there would be an average of 300 meters or 1,000 feet of lowering of the surface of the continents. Well, you know, average height of your continents is 623 meters. So you're, uh, you know, you're, you're really about half done in, uh, in 10 million years and so on. Rates of erosion are so fast that over dark time, our present continents could have been eroded to sea level over 100 times. There should not be continents left. It does not appear that we have gone through even one cycle of erosion of uplift of the continents because the whole July column is still there. The old layers are there, the new layers are still there. We have not gone through even one cycle of this. So uh, are the present rates of erosion in the ocean, uh, uh, at the present rate of, <coughs> of erosion, the oceans should be full of sediment. That's just a little corollary here. I'll quickly uh, throw this in. If you're going to carry all the sediment that rivers carry, you know, your oceans are going to fill up. Now, you, you understand when you fill up the oceans, uh, the water is just going to go up higher, but the volume of the ocean, it would be all full. And you can calculate this out. And uh, going quickly over it, uh, uh, I'll simply mention uh, your... Uh, uh, oceans are much bigger than your continents in terms of both surface area and height. Uh, uh, oceans uh, average about uh, 3,800 meters in depth in form. <coughs> but uh, the, these, here's a comment from, from geologists on this. Is, if we next assume the present rate of erosion and exposed continental volumes to have been consistent over, say, the past one billion years, and uh, generally we think the continents have been two and a half, three billion years old, but uh, let's take their figures there. Then we would expect a staggering 30,000 meter thick layer of sediments to cover the sea floors today. And they make this very candid statement here. Apparently we have erred badly in making our assumptions, and I would agree 100% with that. Uh, when we look at the ocean floor, we find at best only 1% of that expected 30,000 meters. Uh, 
was about 30 me uh, 300 meters of sediment in the oceans is a generous figure. Uh, so, you know, uh, it doesn't look like the ocean to fill up. You can, you can talk about uh, subducted into the trenches. That doesn't work. Not that much sediment going in the trenches. Only about 10 to 20 percent of the volume of uh, material produced by the rivers to go into the trenches. Uh, it's not a solution. Furthermore, a lot of your trenches, uh, you know, in your tectonic plate model, don't have sediment in them. Uh, or no significant sediment. It doesn't look like sediment is piling in there and going into the earth in this famous rock cycle. <coughs> so, uh, going on with this, uh, assuming that our growth are in Salon, uh, rate of erosion, and that the continents are less than three billion years old, one can still suggest that the volume of these oceans should have been filled up many times over, conservatively, seven. I, I've seen figures three times as high as that. Uh, but uh, let's be conservative. How come the oceans aren't full? They should have been filled up by what the rivers produce. If you have renewal through this rock cycle of the continents as proposed and so on, uh, you should have production of that, of that uh, much sediment into the ocean as well. Uh, going on there, one must keep in mind that the average lie height, I, I've gone over that uh, to a certain extent here uh, and through the rock cycle, so uh, let's move on to uh, uh, another topic here except to mention this. In the biblical flood model, uh, what it looks like happened is that uh, we had very rapid erosion during the flood to lay down the sediments. We had rapid erosion of some of those sediments to produce the topography we have, like the Grand Canyon. And then things slowed down since then. And that particular rate is what they're using to measure now. Ignoring the flood, they have a serious problem. Well. Uh, rate of production of volcanic ejecta is too fast compared to what is found in the geological record. Well, that's uh, an interesting little sidelight here. That uh, <coughs> the uh, all this volcanic activity that we have is way too fast to fit in those geologic ages. And some of these volcanoes build up mountains. Uh, and so on, part of this, this picture of uh, uh, uplift and uh, erosion and so on. Uh, one of the more exciting days of my life was in Hawaii watching uh, lava flows coming down the <coughs> Kilauea area. Uh, here's a lava flow there. <coughs> uh, here's some more lava flow. And even into the evening, uh, you could see where all this lava is flowing. This, we have a certain amount of this material coming out, and uh, the biggest mountain in the world is Mauna Loa here in Hawaii. Uh, if you start from the floor of the ocean, it's 32,000 feet high, which is higher than uh, Mount Everest. If you start from the floor of the ocean, you understand. But it's uh, about halfway up, you meet sea level in this process. But some people like to say, well, Mauna Loa is the highest mountain in the world, and there's a basis for that type of thing. Uh, and we have other volcanic material here in Utah and so on. So there's volcanic material out there. Here, here's a volume in cubic miles of um, various volcanoes we know of. Uh, Vesuvius, three quarters of a cubic mile. Tambora, 19 cubic miles. Krakatoa in Indonesia. Uh, Tambora was in Indonesia also. Krakatoa. Uh, four and a quarter mi uh, cubic miles. It's Mount St. Helens, one quarter cubic mile. And Mount uh, Pinatubo in the Philippines, uh, four and a quarter miles. So you've got uh, major uh, times of production. Now pick just the period from 1980, sorry, 1960 to 19... Uh, Back up again, 1940 to 1980, that 40 year period. Uh, it includes Mount St. Leonard, but that's a very small one compared to, to what we pick that as an average. Uh, figures have been made, calculated for that. 
how much of this material is produced. Well, uh, between 1940 and 1980, uh, average was three cubic kilometers. Uh, you, that's just for major volcanoes. There's other stuff being produced all the time slowly uh, in these volcanic areas and so on. You, you had one cubic kilometer, so we, we say maybe four cubic kilometers per year. Well, at that current rate of four kilometers year over 2,500 years, we would have 10 billion cubic kilometers of material coming out of these volcanoes. That's 74 times as much volcanic material as you find now in the sediments of the earth. So this would be a layer 19 kilometers higher over the whole earth. Perhaps volcanoes have not been erupting for 2,500 million years. Another problem with the long geologic ages in terms of what observed rates. Well, uh, lastly, let's talk about mountain ranges. They rise too fast. Uh, how fast do mountain ranges rise? Uh, figures are, it takes a long time to determine how fast a, a mountain is rising, so on. I'm not going into the details of that, but uh, Schum, uh, famous paper in 1963, U.S. Geomonograph, talked about a general rate of 7.6 millimeters. Uh, Alps, 1 to 1.5 millimeters is common. Rocky Mountain, 0 to 10, depends on certain parts. Grand Teton's going up 10. Uh, Appalachians, 10. So Andes, we're talking about millimeters per year here uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> rates of how fast these mountains are. Himalayas, uh, Himalayas, whatever you like, uh, 1 to 61. Uh, USGS reported 10 um, lately studies for this, 4 and 5. They use GPS uh, uh, radar for uh, determining this and so on. Tibetan Plateau 1 and so on. Southern Alps uh, in New Zealand uh, 5 to 17 and so on. Uh, and we go on, you know. In general, our mountains are rising, but in the millimeter range uh, per year. Yellowstone Valley, 76 millimeters per year. That's a reason for great concern because uh, in, um, it's a volcanic area. Yes. This is after erosion has been taken into account? Yes. Uh, I'll get to that. Uh, uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, <clears throat> um, at because you know uh, Yellowstone, it's volcanic. Is it is it rising and is it getting ready for some faster activities? What the concern is? Uh, Paracutin, of course, this is just a lo local thing in, in Mexico. Uh, uh, Paracutin, uh, 500 feet in one week. That, that's uh, we're talking not about local things, but you, uh, that thing that came out of a cornfield and a uh, big volcano there. Uh, just the Rocky Mountains here, you know, we're talking zero to, to, to 10 uh, millimeters. Uh, Swiss Alps, one to two millimeters mainly. Some figures talk go as far as 10, but usually they stay in one to two millimeter range or maybe a half a millimeter and so on. Uh, this is a uh, block on Mount Everest. Uh, the, uh, right now, the official figures seem to be about four, four millimeters per year. It's rising and so on. Well, uh, this gets into uh, probably the fastest range we know is in New Zealand, the Southern Alps. Uh, some say 17. Uh, lately, they've been coming down to seven. I saw a figure of five, so on. Uh, but uh, these are rising still uh, in the millimeter range uh, type of thing. Well. Now, note this here. If a mountain rises one millimeter per year, in 100 million years, it would grow 100 kilometers. You know, that's pretty high. Now, average rates of erosion are too slow. 
Average erosion is only 0.06 millimeters per year. So average erosion would not take care of it. But erosion is faster in the mountains. And this has been calculated out at least one study here. Um, it erodes faster in the high mountains, but it, it is estimated that a mountain would have to be 45 kilometers high to keep up with 10 millimeter growth. Because you have, to be, you have to, high mountains, it's faster. So your mountains sh sh have, should be 45 kilometers high to keep up with a rate, uh, an erosion growth rate of 10 millimeters per growth. Of course, we don't have mountains, uh, you know. Uh, several times higher than Everest. Uh, Everest is about nine, nine kilometers high. Some suggest mountains erode as fast as they rise. This is where things get really interesting. Himalayas, three meters per year. Sure, Himalayas there. They, 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 grow, they go up, uh, but they, get, they erode just as fast. This would destroy rocks at the present Alps. Uh, the Alps are one millimeter per year. And a recent paper a, on this, they studied Alps. Yeah, they're growing just as fast as they're eroding. And that's why they're still there. So uh, you start, put that over time, folks. This would destroy the rocks of the present Alps in five million years. How come this whole geologic column is still there? Remember I showed you a picture back there of 150 million years old uh, rocks there in the Alps, uh, that carbonate I showed you? Uh, they used cosmic radiation dating for this. And uh, this is uh, not uh, fully accepted, but it, uh, we won't go into the details of it right now. Uh, I don't know very many of them, but I, I want to give you a quotation on it. If keep eroding the mounds over millions of years, the old generators should be replaced, but they are still there. That's the, these folks say, oh no, uh, Alps, yeah, they're just being replaced as fast as they are. Uh, Everest, yeah, it's being replaced as fast as so on. They're just, they don't realize that at the rates they suggest that, that column should not be there. Mount Everest is a pity as always. Um, here's an interesting quote from uh, Twydale. Uh, it's, it's an article, 203. Twydale is the leading geomorphologist of the world, okay? And Twydale states that, uh, <coughs> this is a, a review of geomorphology published in the leading geology journal of the world here, GSA Bulletin. You're, you're talking about a leading geomorphologist. You're talking about a leading journal. This is what he says. At present, r physical, which he's referring to radiometric dates, which include that beryllium-10 they use uh, for um, uh, dating some, some uh, rates of erosion and so on. At present, physical dates do not stand on their own. Interesting. They must be compatible with stratigraphy. Uh-oh. They're putting in the, some, uh, it's got to fit the model. Stratigraphy is also served to, he's a stratigrapher, you understand. Uh, well, he's, he's mainly a geomorphologist. But, uh, stratigraphy is also served to highlight flaws and the relevance of unexpected factors in physical procedures. So-called Absolute dating is a misnomer. And, you know, geologists talk absolute dating, that's radiometric dating. Uh, he says it's a misnomer. For physical dates provide numerical approximations, preferably considered within the constraints of a stratigraphic framework. You know, this is, you know, you stretch the data to, to get it to try and fit. Uh, so, uh, you need to keep this in mind as you look at this whole thing. Well, uh, in summary, rates of eroding continent. continents would be eroded to sea level 100 times in 2,000 million years. They're still here. 
rate of production of volcanic ejecta in 2005, 74 times as much volcanic material would have been produced as is now found. Now, maybe 10, 20 percent of it could go on into subduction, but that's not much of a solution. Rate of uplift of mountains without erosion, mountain ranges would be 100 to 500 kilometers high just in 100 million years. And your mountains have to be very high in order to have rates that would keep up with, uh, so that erosion would keep up with them. So th that's a summary of what we, we suggested here. Uh, general conclusions, I'll go through these rapidly. There is little question that current geological processes are way too fast to fit into the long geological model. Two, the estimates given are probably low because of neglected riverbed load. Uh, they don't measure the, the stuff that's flowing along the bottom when you're measuring the uh, load of a river. Uh, dissolution of sediments, they don't take that into account. And rare catastrophic events, that's when things really happen, they don't take that into account, uh, would increase discrepancies. So the, the figures we're using are very conservative. The suggested recent increase in geologic activity is contrary to the general scenario of an original hot active earth gradually sinking down. Some say, well, yeah, Earth's extremely active now. That's not the way it should go. It was active at first, it was hot and so on. It slowed down, we should be heading towards equilibrium. That's contrary to that. When you have several factors as varied as erosion, volcanism, mountain uplift, all challenging the long geologic, it is time to consider reevaluating the geological time scale. It's simple data out there, it challenges it. The pertinent data fits better with the biblical model, where we have a recent creation, a subsequent flood responsible for many of the geological features of the crust of the earth. And uh, you go out there, and that, it seems quite evident for that. While the rates of change of Observed do not point to less than 10,000 years. They fit well with what would be expected from the lingering activity of the Genesis flood. During the flood, things went very much faster. In that flood, one would expect that the receding waters would leave parts of the GDI come there, and that is what we find instead of being all gone as expected for the long geologic ages model. Current long ages interpretations tend to ignore the destruction of the young to old geologic layers that are implicit in these models. And in concluding just this, one does not have to abandon scientific data in order to believe the Bible. There is plenty of data there. There are questions, of course, and so on, but there is sufficient data there to give you uh, confidence that the Bible model is correct. Okay, any questions? Relating to your picture showing erosion as the result of a flood where you had the red arrow showing the layer before the water, for some 20 years I've been taking birding, watch, uh, birding walks at Rubido Nature Area. Became quite familiar with the area, including which trees certain hawks sat in regularly. Then we had a flood year in the Santa Ana River Basin. Huge amounts of earth and trees vanished overnight. Acres and acres of topography changed radically from a little tiny river, Santa Ana. It was amazing. I tend to believe your picture. Yeah, well, it's, uh, we need to keep in mind uh, we have been very conservative in the figures we've presented here and something like you mentioned there. These exceptional floods are often ignored in these figures of rates of erosion because they go there, you know, year after year over the river and, you know, maybe a hundred years or every three, four, five or a thousand years a big major flood occurs and so on. That's not included in the figure and so on. So, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, uh, once in a while things happen very rapidly and they tell us, you know, and those are seldom included in these figures. So you figure the pre 
explosion and the, the Precambrian explosion and the death of the fossils all occurred within the flood, time of the flood? Uh, yes. Uh, I would not say abs uh, all of the fossils, no. Uh, there was death before the flood, some. There was, there's been a lot of death since then. Fossils are not n usually preserved very well. Most of it, yes. Most of it, yes. Would be, uh, we're putting that whole, the major part of the geodetic column into the flood uh, in this model, yeah. And the carbon-14 dating and iridium dating and so forth, is that all, does that have any effect on your erosion theories here? Well, it, it doesn't, uh, I'm going to let Paul answer that one. Uh, we've got carbon-14 dates that challenge, very much challenge these long geodetic I mean, Residual carbon-14, we've got over 100 samples of stuff. Of these old layers, they've got carbon-14 in there. Uh, you know, carbon-14 doesn't work very long. It's had five life 5,730 years. And you look into, uh, go to Utah, for instance, and look at some of those coal seams there, you, and you find carbon-14 in there. And uh, uh, it dates, you know, 30, 40,000 years. Well, you know, that, that doesn't fit either model, you understand? But it challenges the long ages model much more than it challenges the creation model. We think that there was less carbon-14 before the flood, that's why you get those older dates. I have a question. Um, thanks for bringing this up again. It, it reminded me of the problem here, and I'm glad you, you brought that again. But um, I kind of I see a conflict of answers to this problem. Um, first of all, we make an argument that the, there's so much time, the erosion would have wiped out all the land. It would all go into the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we come with a flood, which you even said mm -hmm. is a huge amount of erosion. So to get these layers by the flood, you'd probably have to have most of the Earth's crust homogenized just about to, to make these layers come, come across mm -hmm. on the um, you know, geological column. Now, with mm -hmm. that situation, it seems to me that that heavier water that's holding that, that soil would, would run down into the low parts of the earth, causing the problem that you're looking for anyway with a long term of time. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing, a, I'm seeing a problem here with both answers. Um, mm -hmm. It's all a mystery to me, <laughs> but... Um, um, I mean, even you can go to the Gulf of Mexico, and there's, they call these, there's places out there where they got mm -hmm. hypersaline pools on the bottom of the ocean that's, that are themselves like little lakes. And, um, and that's just because that water's heavier with the heavier salt. Mm -hmm. So now you've got, mm -hmm. on a flood, you've got all this soil mixed with the water. Mm -hmm. So to me, it seems like with the time after the 40 days and 40 nights, mm -hmm. you got about a year of runoff, all this water would have carried tons and tons, most, most all of what's on the geologic column to the bottom of the ocean right then. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know what happened exactly during the flood. Mm -hmm. There are different models. Implicit in the creation model is this major flood. That's part of the biblical account, you know, of the first few chapters of Genesis. Uh, I prefer a model where the continent sank down during the flood. So that's where the stuff landed, ended, not out there. Then they came back up at the end of the flood. They'd come up naturally at the end of the flood, because you, know, you have all this granite, light granitic rock uh, supporting the continent. That's why we're not in the ocean right now, uh, type of thing. So uh, uh, that alleviates that model. But I think your comment is, is uh, true to a certain extent. You know, uh, we have to postulate a past that is different. But the two models is one, no, no flood. 
the other model is, yes, there was a flood. I think this data fits better with the model that was a flood than the model there is no flood. But it's, they're two different models. So. Dr. Roth. Yeah. Um, have you looked at uh, fault slip rates and compared that with, with any of this? F fault slippage? Yeah, fault slip rates, like the uh, oh. San Jacinto, say, San Jacinto. maybe oh. 1.5 millimeters well, per year, or you know. San Andreas, maybe 5 millimeters per year. Because yeah. if you do that, you're going to be up in San Francisco and beyond real quick. Sure. Uh, I might point out, you know, part of this uh, picture that we presented here about the mountains rising slowly is uh, reinforced to a certain extent by the plate tectonics model, where they see these continents moving, you know, 1 to 10 millimeters, uh, some higher rates than that, per year type of thing. Uh, so it tends to enforce that their ID per se, but your your point, of course, is that uh, you've got the same problem here. Uh, geologists, a lot of geologists admit, hey, you know, we are in an extremely active part of Earth history. Well, you know, this is to a certain extent special pleading. Everybody does a certain amount of special pleading, but you, you've got to. Uh, uh, you like to have uh, data that uh, supports this. And uh, of course, you know, they say, well, it went slower in the past than it does now, per se. And uh, in terms of the question we're asking, that is circular reasoning. In terms of their model, it is not circular reasoning. They're just trying to answer it within that paradigm. So you keep that in mind. Yeah. When we talk about a flood, we talk about water that covered literally the whole Earth. Would you theorize that maybe in portions it did cover? Well, and there's some theories that actually say no, it was a flood and it was in spotty areas. Big, wa mm -hmm. big water here, a, little, a lot of land, but more water there. Which model do you cover? I mean, is it worldwide wipeout of everything was water or just in parts? The Bible seems to indicate that as, as the model. I mean, from, from that perspective, you'd say, you know, the highest mountains were covered uh, 15 cubits above type of thing seems to be the case. Uh, uh, I don't think it was covered that high very long, but I think probably that uh, I would, you know, put that in the picture. Or were there even mountains? I mean, I mean, some of the stuff around here are mostly hills. Would we, could it be a large hill? Uh, uh, they may not have to have been as high. Uh, you know, if you uh, take the earth, uh, make it a perfectly smooth sphere, you're going to have water, about 2.4 kilometers of water over the whole Earth. So you've got room for a certain amount of topography during the flood. Yeah, you've got room for, because you know, two and a half kilometers, it's, it's a respectable amount of water. Yeah. <clears throat> Just uh, an observation. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the geologic column, it appears that at least at some times there was a lot more volcanic activity than there is now. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of the uh, Columbia Basalt. And the De De but there's also Plateau. the Deccan yeah, traps Deccan. in India. Mm -hmm. But, but I, you know, mm -hmm. the Columbia Basalt apparently <clears throat> is supposed to be some place where the uh, uh, where the hot spot is now underneath Yellowstone, who uh, deposited, oh, pretty much, what, half the state of Washington under mm -hmm. uh, massive basalt that's, you know, 1,000 th uh, feet thick or something like that. It's huge. Uh, and that had to be enough to where much of that was liquid at one point so that when it crystallized, you had layers that went for, uh, you know, miles in every direction. And I'm not aware of any uh, any lava flows at this time anywhere on Earth that uh, that approach that size. Yeah, we've got uh, you know between. Uh San Francisco Peaks and uh, 
Cameron, Utah, uh, Arizona. I don't know, it's probably about 70 miles. There is one lava flow that traveled that far. <coughs> uh, one of the things that I was so surprised when I was watching these lava flows there in Hawaii, you know, was, uh, uh, that was so fortunate. I was, I was at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology doing research on corals, and, and I heard about this. And I thought, boy, I went and got a plane, flew down to, <laughs> to Hilo, and got up there and looked at that stuff. My only chance to see active volcanic activity. Uh, the strange thing that you notice there is that uh, it does harden on the top, but it doesn't below, and it can maintain heat for quite a way, quite a distance uh, below and flowing below. And you saw some of those uh, streamers, you know, that I showed you in one of those pictures, flowing down and so on. Uh, uh, if they keep the environment hot, they can keep flowing to a certain extent. But uh, I don't know of any uh, thing as widespread as those uh, Columbia basalt things. Uh, th that's a different story entirely. Okay, well, you folks have a good Sabbath. Thank you very yeah. much. Next week, be prepared for uh, prayer conformities and soft sediment deformation, the, the second installment of this, which will be uh, fascinating in and of themselves. Yeah, well, that, that's um, even more exciting than this. The neat thing about this thing, it's simple. It's right there, folks. It's so obvious. Uh, so bring your brains back next Sabbath.